drink. Uh, we have here Marcus. Um, are you there, Marcus? I am. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. So let's uh, let's learn about Kubernetes, right, Marcus? Yes, this right. uh, wonderful piece of thing that uh, I'm going to talk about today. All right, I'll leave it to it. Thanks. Hello, everybody. And in an in-person event, I would have started off this talk with like looking at you in the audience and then asking a couple of questions like, who of you heard of Kubernetes and who of you has used it in the past or is about to use it and is therefore in this talk now. But unfortunately, Europerson 2021 needs to happen online again. So, um, well, here we are. This is an online talk. I hope you enjoy it. This talk should be a brief introduction into what Kubernetes is and how it works. Not on this low level, what happens underneath the surface. That's not the intention of this talk. But what I want to uh, provide in this talk is more the higher level um, usage of, of Kubernetes that we as developers, DevOps engineers um, might be using, um, are using in, in, in our world these days. So how do we deploy our code to Kubernetes? Some of you may know me from my engagement in the Django project. And historically, I've been primarily contributing to its migration system. Over time, my focus shifted to organizing some Django cons in Europe and Australia, as well as being a member of its operations and security teams. In my day job, I'm a staff engineer and team lead at Microbiolytics and responsible for our cloud infrastructure and software. At Microbiolytics, we build hardware and software to analyze chemical liquids and then try to revolutionize and modernize that industry and bring it into the well modern world and into the context of Industry 4.0. We're also hiring for Python, Django, C Sharp, and Angular, and numerous other positions. But I want to come back to the first question of this talk, what is Kubernetes? And first and foremost, Kubernetes is a distributed system to run containers. Not only Docker containers, because there's also others out there, but mostly it's Docker these are still out there. Another term for Kubernetes would be it's an orchestrator. However, you can't just run a container in Kubernetes. There's a bit more around there that you need to take care of and that will allow Kubernetes to do the things it does. The smallest deployable object in Kubernetes is a something called a pod. A pod runs at least one container and they, like the pods, ensure that their containers are restarted if needed or desired. So if a container dies for whatever reason, the pod or Kubernetes underneath will ensure that the container is restarted. Or if you want the pods vanish when all containers are terminated. So if you have one of scripts, Kubernetes could start a pod, run the container in there, and when the container terminates, the pod also goes, goes away. And I'll be going a bit more into detail on pods in a moment. But for now, let's look at how you'd actually communicate with Kubernetes. So you generally talk to a REST API that runs on manager nodes in Kubernetes. The counterparts to those nodes are worker nodes. They, those are the nodes that actually run your code, run the pods, run the containers. So you interact with Kubernetes typically using a command-like tool use, um, called kubectl, kubectl, as I prefer to call it. And with that, you essentially can do pretty much everything within Kubernetes. Kubernetes has this property of being eventually consistent, which means just because you told Kubernetes through kubectl to the API to do something, and the API responded with, okay, I'm done, it doesn't actually mean it's done. Well, not necessarily, anyway. It's eventually consistent. So some operations may take a while to be fulfilled. So imagine you deploy 100 pods with containers in there, all the servers underneath will need to pull the Docker images or pull the images and then start them. So this may take a while 
So it's eventually consistent because it's eventually will reach the point where it has deployed and run all the containers. And it's also eventually consistent because, well, if a container dies, as mentioned, Kubernetes can restart it. Or if a worker node dies, Kubernetes will be able to automatically move all the workload on that node to other nodes in the cluster. Or depending on how you deploy Kubernetes itself, like not the stuff in Kubernetes, but Kubernetes itself, maybe it will even restart or start spin up a new worker node potentially even automatically when there's too much work in, on the cluster. So what does Kubernetes look like on an architectural level? Um, this is an, let's, let's say this is the overall cluster that you can see here. Um, the cluster is typically standalone, but you can technically run multiple clusters and then have them interact with each other. Within the clusters, you have the nodes. I left out the, work, the, the master nodes or the manager nodes here for now, and because they are not really relevant in this design here. So these are the, the worker nodes that we are talking about. So within the cluster, you have nodes, worker nodes, and the, in the chart here, I'm using three of them. When you run Kubernetes locally on your, on your laptop or computer with tools like Minikube or K3S, you probably only have one node because that's usually sufficient there. But this moment when you want to do something somewhat serious with Kubernetes, you want at least two nodes, but even better three because that accounts for better reliability. So this is solely for reliability and redundancy to have more than one node. Nodes can either be physical bare metal servers or VMs in your cloud provider, such as EC2 instances on AWS. And in fact, when you use your cloud providers hosted or Kubernetes as a service, like AKS, EKS, and GKS, they effectively use the VMs of those cloud uh, systems underneath. So if you want a cluster to survive a data center fire and such, you would make sure to place the nodes across different data centers and set them up networking. But this is something that your typical cloud provider does for you, and you don't really need to worry about that. As mentioned earlier, on the nodes, we have these pods. And they are spun up on the nodes that have the required resources available. So when you have a fairly beefy, a couple of fairly beefy nodes, then they potentially run more pods than others. And if unlike this, this one node that's very small and doesn't really have any memory or CPUs. And yeah, there exists just a single instance of a pod here in this in this um, example with the yellow one. Um, this is just a single pod that's that's being started in Kubernetes. Uh, other pods can exist multiple times, and this is, for example, the case when you have something called a deployment, which essentially starts the same pod with the same containers underneath multiple times. So when you have your web application that you want to scale out, you can increase the number of pods of the same thing and it will, quote, just work. So for example, the blue and green pods here exist two times. The orange and red ones exist three times. For the orange one, something called a pod anti-affinity is defined. In order to prevent the same pod to be run more than once per node, essentially. So this is something, usually a good idea when you want to scale out. Otherwise, when a node goes down, it might take too many pods of the same kind down simultaneously, which would be the case, for example, for the red pods when node three goes down. Similarly, there's something called a pod affinity which could be set for the green and blue pods to ensure that they run on the same nodes, like always a blue and a green pod next to each other. And this is something you could do when you want to make sure to reduce, net, for example, network communication um, by then communicating directly between the pods on the same node without going through the, let's call it wiring between two nodes. And there's also a concept called node affinity 
which lets you spin up a port on a specific type of node. So if you have these nodes that run, that have um, graphic cards in there with GPUs, and you have some computational expensive operations that you can um, run on a GPU, then you could run and pin those ports and with that the containers onto those nodes that have the GPUs and avoid other ports being run there, for example. Well, and lastly, within the, doc in, within the ports, we have the containers. And as mentioned, there's at least one. And it's important to remember that all containers within a pod run on the same node. Now, let's look a bit at the concepts behind Kubernetes. As a developer, engineer, um, or DevOps person, what are we going to be exposed to? Well, essentially, everything within Kubernetes is a resource. And we've seen one of them already, which are the pods. And resources have a couple of attributes, for example, the kind, which essentially defines what kind of resource it is, a version, some metadata, a specification, for example, for, for technical requirements or so. Um, and in part of the metadata is also a name, a unique identifier, and, and dozen other things. Resources can either exist within the whole cluster, which is then means they are cluster scoped, or they could exist within namespaces. And the interesting part is that a namespace itself is a resource, which is cluster scoped. So everything that you put inside a namespace is then namespace scoped. Um, and yeah, all the other resources that are out there are, it's just sheer endless list. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, but some of the typical ones that we need in the, as an example, in the example towards the end of the uh, presentation. Um, but yeah, in this list, you find all the official building blocks for Kubernetes, and then there's hundreds more out there that can be installed separately. I've already mentioned namespaces. They are a key resource because other resources exist on or can exist within the namespace itself. So when you want to create a pod, you need to create the namespace first for that pod to live in, for example. Now, on what you can see here on the left side is a bit of YAML that's, which is like the, the thing in the Kubernetes world you write when you define something. Um, and this, these four lines essentially define how a namespa namespace should look like or that you want to create a namespace. Um, other resources look fairly similar um, and we'll see that in a second. Here's an API version, there's a name and there's some metadata. When you're interacting with Kubernetes, you typically, as mentioned, use a tool called kubectl. And on the right side, by default, when you do kubectl get namespaces, you see a list of already present namespaces, such as the kube system or the default namespace. Then there's this kubectl apply command, which you can pass a file name, which essentially then lets kubectl take the content of that file, put it to the Kubernetes API and do something with that. And when you then go and like list the namespaces again, well, in this case, we see that the namespace, namespace now, now already uh, exists. As mentioned, there are pods as the lowest deployable entity. And this is what a pod could look like. Again, we have the API version, we have the kind. Um, but what we have here, more importantly, is that in the spec, we have, uh, can list the containers, and we can define that the image for this container should be the traffic who am I Docker container. Um, the name essentially lets Kubernetes uniquely identify the container within the pod. So the name needs to be unique within the container. And then we are exposing some uh, port to the outside. Well, not to the internet in that sense, but outside of the pod. And similarly um, with uh, with the, the, the um, 
kubectl command, you can do get pods and apply to create those. For now, uh, additionally, we have services that we can uh, use for network routing. Um, so you don't need to necessarily need to fiddle, uh, fiddle around with IP addresses, but with, with mostly with names and, and labels in, um, in Kubernetes. Here, for example, we have a service which has a name who am I, which looks for pods with ha which have this, this label in the selector part and which have a port that is also specified there. So port 8080, um, our port target name HTTP and expose it as port 8080 with the name HTTP, which we then in the next step can expose to the internet using HTTP. And when we deploy Django, for example, or any of other and most other web applications these days, we have a reverse proxy somewhere, usually or typically or fairly often Nginx, but also Apache and whatnot. And ingresses in Kubernetes are essentially our reverse proxies. And Nginx is kind of the de facto standard in the Kubernetes world, but there are others such as traffic. And in recent versions of Kubernetes, the ingress resource has become a bit more complex, but you'll get and understand them eventually once you, you start using them a bit more frequently. Essentially, when the HTTP requests um, host this example.com, we'll redirect, or Nginx will redirect everything that starts with a sling, single forward slash to our Who Am I service on port 8080 which in turn will forward the request to any of the ports that were selected by that service. So essentially what we did here is we can, we can do here with ingress, ingresses and services is route any arbitrary HTTP traffic that can come into our Kubernetes cluster to any arbitrary port. And with the setup we have here, if you have a two-staged service with a dedicated front end and a backend application, you could, for example, route everything which starts with slash API to your backend and everything else to your front end. And then there are config maps and secrets, which are essentially the, the thing that is been also, also, also known as a 12 factor, as a thing part of the 12 factor approach or app. So everybody, everything, everybody, everything should be configured using environment variables if possible. And yeah, we can do that in Kubernetes as well. We can either hard code the variables in, in pod definitions or using config maps and secrets. There are a few differences between the latter two, but I'm not going to into the differences here because that's outside the scope. Like this depends on how the data is effectively, effectively saved inside the Kubernetes cluster and that. Config maps are usually for like random configuration information Secrets are for, well, secrets such as your know, secret key database credentials, email credentials, all this. And while config maps usually contain the value in clear text, the value in secrets is typically base64 encoded. I suspect because secrets typically or fairly often has have, have um, special characters such as quotes and whatnot in them. And then base64 encoding them in, Kubernetes, uh, in, in YAML is a good idea to avoid confusion there. And the last Kubernetes resource we're going to look at are deployments. It's a way to tell Kubernetes to run the pod using a given, given template a set number of times. This is a fairly amount, big amount of, of YAML here on the left side. But the key part is that at the top, we can set replicas and we want to have the, the pods running underneath. We want three pods, identical pods. And the selector labels here are essentially for Kubernetes to find the pods that it should manage. And similar with the template, or inside the template, we can put everything that we can put in a pod definition to then go and like, well, use this template to create new pods and a bunch of them. On the right side, again, we can see how we can use kubectl. And what we see on the in the last part section there is this kubectl um, where, we, where we list all pods, you can see, well, this one QMI pod 
that we deployed earlier, but also these three new spun up pods with these random arbitrary names or parts of the names in there. Um, so yeah, this is how, what the pods would then look like. Well, now that the basics are hopefully clear, what we can do and, and um, with Kubernetes and how Kubernetes works on a high level, let's look at how this would look for a Django project. It turns out it's not that much. It's fairly small things we need to do. So we need a config map where we need to set a loud house. And the first one, this myapp.com is probably clear. This is the domain we want to run our app underneath. But then the another one, the my app, my namespace, as we see cluster local, is essentially a Kubernetes internal DNS name. And with that, we can talk to this service within our cluster without needing to know the external domain. And the, the secret essentially contains the secret key in the database URL, um, which points to some database either inside Kubernetes or running outside. Um, and yeah, a secret key. And then within Django, we can use the wonderful DJ database URL com um, package to, to load the database field and have it automatically set up and pass if it's Postgres or SQLite and whatnot. We can split the allowed hosts on, on a comma um, to ensure we can support multiple. We make sure that debug needs to be explicitly turned on, um, which we didn't do in um, in Kubernetes as a that's the correct choice there. And yeah, we load the secret key from an environment variable and because Django will refuse loading or starting without the secret key. We can also just error out when there's a key error when the, when the environment variable isn't even defined. And then in our deployment, we refer to the config maps and secrets in their entirety and not only key by key, what we can see here in, in the env from, which essentially maps all the keys in the, in this maps as the environment name and the values as the corresponding values. And then the last two things I briefly want to mention are the Docker file, which has a custom entry point and the default command, which is then essentially the gunicorn setup to run the app. The entry point is does a couple of things. First of all, it makes sure that um, the database is up. So well, for Postgres, for example, there's a PG ready command using the Django admin shell here with, with this way with the command allows us to avoid double configuration of environment variables. And essentially by repeatedly checking that the app is up while we start it, we can just, well, start the pod and it will wait until the app is actually uh, the database connection is actually established and uh, and available and secondly it applies all migrations while this can be tricky given proper testing and careful consideration the migration the implications of migrations between two relays this i've used this pattern of just running migrations on every deploy numerous times now and you can check more actually my talk from DjangoCon Europe this year to get more insight on, on this particular topic there. And then lastly, if you do have UI components in your backend, you can run collect static for the static files to collect them. Well, and then we, we execute the command that we started off with. And that is essentially Kubernetes. And yeah, I hope there's a couple of uh, information in, in here that's helped you and that you can now go and like, okay, at least have a bit of understanding of what Kubernetes is. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. Um, there's definitely a lot of YAML. Um, oh yes, there's a lot of YAML. <laughs> we, we have a couple of questions. Um, First one, is there any resource you recommend for beginners to learn Kubernetes in practice? Doing it, playing around with it, and then reading up on things that don't work. Mm 
like literally sit down and s I'm not sure if the I, I, re I seem to remember there's a bit of a tutorial on the Kubernetes website itself, but I'm not entirely sure. Cool. So that would be yeah, like to, to the, for the very basics. I mean, this is there's so many things that I haven't covered here with regards to SSL, with regards to permissions, with regards to all kinds of other things. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, I, I heard about the learn Kubernetes the hard way. Mm -hmm. If you know about that, I, I don't know if it's if it's good. I haven't I haven't tried it yet. I've heard about it. That's about it. Cool. I've not looked at it at all. <laughs> my exp my experience with Kubernetes is pretty much being thrown into the cold water and playing around with it and figuring it out while having right. people at hand that have more experience, <laughs> have experience with it. But yeah. Fair enough. Uh, second question is similar. Um, is there any good example of a Kubernetes config or like a project that uses Kubernetes that one can read to learn about it? Not from, not that I know from the top of my head. No, can't can't name anything right now. Sorry. Cool, no worries. I, I guess people can use the your slides uh, as yeah. boilerplate for Django app, right? I suspect so. Yes. Awesome. Uh, that's it. Uh, thanks, Marcus. Thanks again. You're welcome.